Well, good afternoon. Okay, good, good. All right, I think we had a little too much lunch. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator. I'm also going to try to frame the, the discussion. Uh, and then we'll kind of work our way through the life cycle of material weapons design. We'll start with requirements and then with General Murray, and then uh, we'll have Dr. Jetty make some remarks. And we'll have uh, Mr. Trey Stevens, bad cleanup. Uh, and then we'll open it up to the room for questions. Because a lot of this uh, for us is as much um, an opportunity to have a discussion. We've been doing a lot of talking. We've made a lot of decisions in the last year. And much of how we will be successful in the future is how we work with industry, Congress, uh, as we proceed. So um, I'll try to guide the conversation with these gentlemen, talk about our new operating model and the highlights of its inherent value. So today presents a great opportunity for us to discuss Army Futures Command and the stand-up of the work ahead of us. In particular, I'm flanked with the two men that are going to be driving this process with requirements and acquisition. And Trey can help us feather out the perspective of small business and entrepreneurs and what it's like to be a vendor with a customer like the U.S. Army. So AFC has been uh, an opportunity for us to bring two key stakeholders together, acquisition and requirements. And it'll be critical as this pursuit is the pathfinder to help us revolutionize the Army because this is a process of fundamentally changing the mindsets of our soldiers and civil servants assigned to these two organizations. Our new operating model is fusing all of these stakeholders together as a team of teams. We can no longer continue the mindset of handing off a baton between one stakeholder to another. We've got to become like a football team, shoulder to shoulder, marching down the field, doing it together, blocking for each other, gang tackling the opposition, sharing information, and helping each other deal with difficult problems. The mindset is how we reduce span time in making decisions to obtain clarity and unity of purpose in our actions. For this command to be successful, it will have to execute to the letter on its focus on management of S&T and R&D investments, communication and collaboration with recruiting requirement leaders, R&D, and, and, uh, and acquisition reflected by reducing span time and requirements and discipline throughout the entire process. Over the last 20 years, our challenges have been simple to identify. As our inability to tie operating concepts to material design has hamstrung our ability to work with industry to get successful outcomes. We have also become intensely bureaucratic and often overcomplicate the procurement process, thus dragging out sales cycles and squeezing the cash flow of our vendors, making us a very difficult customer. Secretary Esper, General Milley and I, and General McConville are shoulder to shoulder in the need to change and our operating style and improve our ability to get solutions to our warfighters with relevance. Since last September, or since, last, since October 2017, we have solidified our new operating concept, focused our budgets in FY18 and 19 against our six priorities. We've selected eight CFT leaders. We selected a four-star commander. And we've chosen a city in America to house our, our command's headquarters, and we've declared IOC. We're moving out and there's no turning back. Our leadership team is also totally committed to financing the 21 signature systems and our CFT priorities as shown in our actions in FY18 and 19 and what will be soon to unveil in the FY20 program in February. We will do what we must to provide the resources our team needs to bring these capabilities to the force. We've changed our culture and the only way to solidify these gains are with strong leaders that buy into the leadership agenda and into each other. We have shown the will to act over the last year, and now we have to show the will to follow through. And there are no two people that will do the more than the men to my left and right. General Murray. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. And it's great to see the, uh, the interest in Army modernization uh, in Army Futures Command. And up front, I want to just make sure everybody understands that Army Futures Command and the Army's modernization effort have one fundamental focus, and that's to make soldiers and units more lethal. And that is really the only metric that matters uh, to me and to the Army. Um, it's all about the output of the process the Secretary just described. Army remains globally engaged in a complex, dynamic, and increasingly uncertain world where potential adversaries are challenging our overmatch across a number of critical warfighting capabilities. And that reality is not going to change 
quickly and without a lot of effort. Acquisition Enterprise saddles a fantastic workforce across requirements and acquisition with stovepipe organizations and overwhelming administrative burdens. The Army senior leaders have recognized that it's time to break from this procedural industrial age system towards a nimble information age modernization enterprise. So working with my partners, and that would be Forcecom, TRADOC, the Army Material Command, and the great team that Dr. Jetty leads, leads and others, we will build and connect a future force modernization enterprise that meets and anticipates the needs of our soldiers and combatant commanders by rapidly delivering lethal and effective future capabilities. As I stand up Army Futures Command, I have four fundamental and overriding priorities. First is to recruit, hire, and place talent across the Army Futures Command organization. We are being very deliberate about lining the right mix of talent, both military and civilian, against the complex problems that the Army has been asked to solve and must solve. Second, build relationships and establish our footprint with entrepreneurs, innovative incubators, university systems, and just as important, the defense industry. Third, embrace the type of culture we need within our organization to transform from the cogs and stovepipe procedures of the industrial age to the speed and connectivity of the information age. And fourth, integrate Army organizations and missions. And I fully understand that change is hard. It will be disruptive and uncomfortable. Building the team from existing organizations dispersed across the United States will take leadership and patience, but without pain, there will be no gain. Army's Future Command is designed to tie all these efforts together and focus them on one fundamental goal. And once again, that is to make soldiers and units more lethal, ready to deploy, fight, and win our nation's wars. This command will provide more than oversight of cost, schedule, and performance. It will provide value to the American people, to the Congress, to the Joint Force, to the Army, and most importantly, to the young men and women who will be defending our ideals and, and freedoms on a future battlefield. So let me just spend a couple minutes describing what success might look like in this effort. As I've said, we must build modern capabilities that make soldiers and units more lethal, enable them to deploy, win our nation's wars, and most importantly, return home safely. These capabilities must be sustainable, rapidly available, and affordable. To do this, we are transforming the Army modernization enterprise to improve our ability to equip warfighters with the tools they need when and where they need them. Our current process is a legacy of the 20th century, and all through, through that, although it served us well during the last century, it is lengthy, costly, and methodical odyssey from future concepts to capabilities requirements then virtual experimentation, prototyping, live experimentation, and then, if it's all going well, a whole other lengthy process to acquire and field that capability. Along this journey, the goal becomes consensus because organizations involved, a majority of the people in organizations involved, have the ability to say no, with only a few with the ability to say yes. This laborious consensus building often results in capabilities being either late to need for the role they were intended to fill, <coughs> or else gold-plated into costly technology bets. The results have been widely publicized and costly failures of major Army programs over the past few decades. Leaders over the years have applied numerous workarounds, shortcuts, and band-aids to this process, resulting in a patchwork of additional sub-processes pro sub and niche organizations, many of which work for different bosses and are not integrated. Army's Future Command will bring all of these disparate organizations together on one roof, working within a future force modernization enterprise that is leader-driven, not process-driven, that is focused on output, not process, that is focused on and driven by our one and only customer, and that's the American soldier. This means stepping outside of the antiquated acquisition process into a commercial business-to-business -business environment that is very unfamiliar to the Army. We are doing this by physically placing ourselves near innovative, agile industries and institutions. As the Secretary mentioned, Austin, Texas was chosen as a location for the new Army Futures Command headquarters because of its proximity. It provides the talent, private sector innovation, academic research and development, and quality of life. A few examples of some of the things we're working on uh, just a couple weeks ago. Um, we held a hackathon, it's called Hack of the, uh, the Hack of the Drones, where teams of civilian developers, designers, and hackers spent the weekend working alongside, importantly, soldiers from the operational force, students and technology experts from the Army to prototype solutions for countering small unmanned aerial systems. 
Last week, we sponsored a week-long event called the Austin Startup Week, which brought together Army stakeholders with venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, researchers, industry partners, and again, most importantly, soldiers, to explore topics of common interest. With this and similar events in the future, our goal is to improve the Army's access to innovative ideas and products that complement our traditional capability developments effort. The Army's initial efforts to do this over the past year makes me optimistic. As everyone knows, last October at this very forum, we announced the stand-up of not only Army Futures Command, but also eight cross-functional teams, or CFTs, aligned with the six Army modernization priorities. In less than 12 months, the cross-functional teams have validated our approach by producing solutions that are rapidly delivering to our soldiers. In most cases, cutting the traditional requirements to acquisition timeline in half or better. A great example of this is what's known as IVAS, or the Heads Up Display, or HUD 3.0. As early as 2009, the Army had identified a need for an immersive virtual training and visual augmentation, but limits in the required technology, TRL levels, made that development impossible. Recently, the Soldier Lethality Cross-Functional Team helped identify a disruptive new technology, making it possible to deliver a single system to the force that they can use to fight, rehearse, and train. What normally would have been a three to five year requirements process was done in three to five weeks. Together with Dr. Jetty's team at ASALT, we have synchronized our acquisition and contracting approaches to field HUD 3.0 to the force before the end of FY20. Given sufficient resources, Army's Futures Command and the CFTs will continue to produce similar results. So to the innovators, entrepreneurs that are here today, whether you're with industry, s and academia, or just have a bright idea, we're interested. Please bring that idea to us. We intend to find the technologies and solutions that will enable us to modernize the force quickly and effectively wherever and whatever they might be. And I thank you for your attendance again. I look forward to your questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to my partner in crime, Dr. Bruce Jetty. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I appreciate having the opportunity to join with uh, Undersecretary McCarthy and General Murray in discussing Army modernization, particularly in delivering future capability to the soldier. Let me take a moment uh, to provide some clarity uh, with respect to responsibilities. Uh, as you all know, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition Logistics and Technology is the Secretary of the Army's representative for all acquisition, logistics, and technology. I, I raise that specifically because sometimes it's thought of as, as uh, looking at uh, ASALT as the senior PEO around, and it has much broader context in supporting uh, the goals and objectives that, uh, uh, that Secretary McCarthy and General Murray have, have referenced here. Um, I provide specific oversight within my statu statutory enumerated responsibilities as both Army Acquisition Executive and as the senior procurement uh, officer uh, for the Army. My role and that of my office is to consider and facilitate all three, AT and L, uh, in modernization and readiness. Uh, today's modernization is, in fact, tomorrow's readiness. Modernization is, is a priority for the Secretary of the Army, and General Murray, as commanding general of the Army Futures Command, has oversight of all the DOTLAM PF. No notice I did not exclude the M. Uh, in achieving uh, an integrated operational capability. General Murray's Futures Command has implementation of the future modernization. The Army wants modernization capabilities defined by AFC. AFC develops uh, the requirements and the full Dotland PF solution uh, for all of these. AFC provides big A acquisition oversight to ensure material solutions provide operational capabilities. Uh, the Army acquisition system the little a portion in particular, is charged with the development, procurement, and delivery of those capabilities. Uh, they build what the Army deems required. They transfer an idea into a material solution. The PEO and PMs uh, have been aligned specifically with respect to the CFTs and Army uh, Futures Command. Uh, with uh, approximately somewhere in the order of 20 major uh, programs in, in the offing and have been directed uh, to develop direct relationships between the PMs and the CFT leads uh, uh, to facilitate um, a, a very close, interactive, bi-directional working relationship. 
this is some people have felt would be a stressful uh, uh, issue. Uh, and in fact, it's been a very positive one and, and General Murray has uh, just alluded to a number of those interactions and how beneficial it's been on both sides uh, of the table, helping to provide uh, a lot of clean focus uh, for the acquisition process and conversely uh, being able to provide uh, technical insights and uh, methodologies by which we could achieve uh, rapid uh, procurements. Uh, we will succeed in this endeavor uh, for uh, an enterprise co collaboration by a single-minded focus, truly a unity of effort. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, there are a number of enablers that uh, we're trying to put in place and have put in place. Uh, ASALT has moved out quickly to implement initiatives uh, designed to enable the, uh, the Secretary of the Army's eight acquisition uh, uh, priorities, uh, expanding delegation of decision authorities, uh, using simple management plans uh, to reduce the streamlining of documentation, improve how we uh, educate and train uh, the acquisition workforce, uh, leverage commercial procurement methodologies, uh, other transactions as allowed, and uh, other smart contracting methodologies and approaches, and evaluating our pro uh, programs and progress through metrics. Now, these initiatives have facilitated speeding delivery uh, of key technology and empowering our key leaders. Congress has given us some uh, very agile uh, uh, additional authorities and acquisition framework. Um, uh, a number of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Section 804, uh, which is a portion of the NDAA that uh, allows for um, uh, rapid prototyping and rapid acquisition. Uh, I signed uh, last, uh, last month the Army's implementation of the middle tier acquisition uh, policy, which provides us with the, uh, a great opportunity to rapidly prototype and or rapidly field capabilities distinct from the traditional acquisition process. The MTA uh, exempts us from DOD uh, 5000 and the JSIDs. And a, a short excursion here is in, in, our, in our application of the uh, middle tier acquisition process, this ability to have this tight, close linkage between how General Murray's organization looks at requirements, we put prototypes of different levels of maturity in his hands and the hands of his soldiers and touch points where they can come back and reform those acquisition, uh, the, the, or I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, the requirements documents so that we don't have a procurement, a requirement document, a procurement, and then an assessment of the, of the requirement, essentially years apart, I believe will be one of the most important uh, aspects of how we can work together. Uh, these knowledge points are going to be used just not just for acquisition risk management, uh, but for uh, a valuable tool for the CFTs as well. Secretary often says, uh, if failure is going to occur, let's fail early and, and cheaply. Uh, we've also uh, embedded in this uh, policy an ability to push those things which are the highest risk, and if they don't succeed, that approach is not going to be successful. Push those to the front, even if it may mean funding gets shifted in order to accomplish that. Um, we, we've done a number of other uh, uh, policies that are either um, in the works uh, or uh, soon to be announced uh, to try and further facilitate it. Uh, this close relationship and um, an ability to do rapid uh, acquisition. Um, one of them is uh, an R&D policy. There are a series of them that will uh, help us improve how we manage our research and development, leading to prototypes, leading to the development of systems. It'll facilitate focus. It'll facilitate the quickest path to failure. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's probably a bad wording, but it's sort of the commercial version of, of uh, trying to get all of your risk up front. And accountability. Uh, we have an, we have current, currently we have an R&D approach that doesn't necessarily make it very easy to figure out whether or not it made good sense that we were running down this path until we've gone way down the path. We're going to fix that. An IP policy. Sounds like kind of an odd or boring issue that's um, one that you wouldn't think would be at the center of being able to deal with uh, rapid acquisition. 
but in fact, how do we protect the contractors for the investment of the IP that they've had? Small business, that's all they have. Innovators, that's all they have. It's their good ideas. If we don't find ways to properly protect them, they're not going to come and, and offer their IP to us. They're going to go to other places to try and find their marketplace. Uh, we need to protect the Army. We invest heavily in IP. And so the question is, how, how uh, do we take delivery? When do we take delivery? And when does it make sense? So that we en don't end up buying everything, which we don't need, and, uh, on, on the uh, uh, opposing side. Make sure that we don't get to the out years and then not know uh, something that even have rights to something that we never took delivery of, and now we're, we're uh, playing catch up. Uh, this will reduce cost, it'll reduce risk, it'll, it'll uh, uh, eliminate some surprise, and it'll generate the proper ownership level across the board. Uh, in all our efforts, the Army continues to work with industry and its partners to reduce acquisition timelines by leveraging streamlined policies uh, to provide capabilities for our soldiers. Uh, let me by, close by saying this is a great time uh, for the Army and Army modernization. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions and, and hope this has provided some insights. Great. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, General Murray, Undersecretary McCarthy, and Dr. Jetty for inviting me to be here on the panel. Uh, secondly, related to that, I realize that given that I don't have a star, um, an honorific, or a PhD, it probably makes sense to introduce myself uh, kind of at the outset. So um, my name is Trey Stevens. I started my career working in the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, lasted about three years there before heading over to Palantir, um, where I was an early employee, focusing on growth um, over the course of about six years. Uh, and for the last five years, I've been a partner at a venture capital fund in San Francisco called Founders Fund. Um, so Founders Fund is uh, uh, an early and large investor in companies like Facebook, uh, Spotify, Stripe, Airbnb, um, as well as Palantir and SpaceX. Uh, so we have a lot of experience in the national security space, but are, broadly speaking, generalist investors. Um, so why is this relevant? Um, you know, the United States has an incredible track record of developing new and innovative technologies, particularly during the Great War and Cold War periods. Our best and brightest during those, those phases uh, were kind of focused on critical engineering fields, whether that was mechanical, electrical, physics, and were dedicated to working on programs of national significance. Post-Cold War, declining interest from the technology community has really resulted in kind of a lack of engagement with industry. Um, in fact, in the last 30 years, only two multi-billion dollar um, venture-backed companies have emerged out of the tech community, um, doing the ma majority of the work with the US government, Palantir and SpaceX. That's it, there's just two. So if you're a venture fund trying to make um, great investments in this space, your options have historically been pretty limited. Um, so when I joined Founders Fund um, about five years ago, I set out to see if I could find the next Palantir or SpaceX. Um, I went through all the contracting data and started meeting with any company who had submitted a response to an RFI, RFP, or won a contract, um, met with hundreds of companies, and made one investment. Um, this was pretty concerning to me. Um, so I tried to figure out what, what it was about Palantir and SpaceX that made them, un that made them similar. You know, one's a rocket company, one's a software company. Um, you would think that they'd be pretty different. It turns out they're actually pretty similar. Um, they both build a product rather than participate in like program development, custom program development. Um, they both interact very, uh, um, very strongly with uh, Capitol Hill. Neither of them partner particularly well with Primes. Um, and m maybe most notably, they both have billionaire co-founders. So the world that we've kind of found ourselves in is one of Howard Hughes' defense entrepreneurship, where unless you have a billionaire on your cap table, you probably don't have the capital or the wherewithal to actually succeed in this market. Um, last year, uh, late 2016, early 2017, I served on the defense transition team focused on uh, technology. Uh, and in that process, it kind of reached a couple of conclusions. Um, one was that a lot of the priorities that we have in technology are software, not hardware problems, whether that's autonomous systems, applied artificial intelligence, uh, some aspects of quantum computing, cybersecurity. And, uh, and another is that there actually aren't that many <coughs> startups, venture-backed companies, that are playing in a meaningful way with the DOD. 
And so when I came back to San Francisco, I decided to partner up with some of my friends, Palmer Lucky, who is the inventor and founder of Oculus Rift, which was acquired by Facebook for a few billion dollars, and Brian Schimpf, who is the director of engineering at Palantir, to start a company specifically focused on bringing software talent back into working on programs of national security significance that's called Anderl, which I won't belabor you guys with an explanation of, but you can look into it. Um, so, you know, software is really different than hardware. Uh, it, when you're building aircraft carriers or you're building stealth planes, you're build, building uh, precision guided weapons or satellites that uh, set up a GPS constellation, um, these are really capital intensive program, programs that probably wouldn't exist had it not been for government investment. Software, on the other hand, is massively democratized. In countries like Iran and North Korea, who have the ability to conscript their best talent into working on these things, with very, very small amounts of money, they can actually disrupt the world order. Um, and th this kind of changes the framing of how we need to think, think about getting talent into this space. Um, you know, the, by and large, the top software engineers working on things, particularly in like the applied artificial intelligence space, are not working in the basement of a windowless building um, in the Beltway. They're working on ad targeting at Google and Facebook. And they're not doing that because they necessarily really believe that the important thing to work on is ad targeting. Um, they're doing that because they don't believe that there's a viable option to do something significant elsewhere. So then the question, why is that? Why are we not presenting them with good opportunities at companies they want to work for? Um, I believe that the defense ecosystem has done a fantastic job at building innovation programs since the end of the Cold War. Um, from the advent of Incutel in 1999 to the Strategic Capabilities Office in 2012 to DIU, Defense Digital Service, Hacking for Defense, in 2015 and to the stand-up of Army Futures Command here in 2018, we've made leaps towards making it easier for innovative new businesses to do work at the department. The interest and intentionality has quite honestly been overwhelming to the tech community. We see it, we're aware of it, we appreciate it. However, the struggle comes when transitioning from innovation, from piloting, into programs that have meaningful revenue tied to them. As a venture capitalist, I can't invest in a company based on pilot revenue. It's non-recurring, it's unclear if it's ever going to be there again, and there's not great track record of those things turning into to meaningful revenue. So, you know, there's, there's kind of two strategies in venture capital. You can do like the spray and pray strategy, or you can do the concentrated capital strategy. Um, let's imagine for a moment that the United States has a $100 million innovation fund. Our current strategy looks something like writing $400,000, $250,000 checks and saying, hopefully some of these will work out. China, on the other hand, using that same size budget, let's hypothetically say $100 million, they're writing four $25 million checks. Why does this matter? A $25 million check from the government is backable by private industry. As a venture capitalist, I can now come in and continue to put money into those companies to help them grow. And now what that does is it creates viable options for engineers to go and work on that are not ad targeting at Google and Facebook. We have, to, we have to move away from a spray and pray model into one that's concentrated, where we are helping build businesses that have the ability to compete and win against incumbents uh, that are traditionally the, the defense primes. So um, you know, there are lots of examples we could, we could bring up about times where we made uh, we tried to start making larger investments in these companies, and the, they ended up being killed for whatever reason by protests or Congress. Um, I'm not going to go over all of those opportunities, um, but my, my hypothesis is that this is really where the problem begins. Um, you know, development, as Dr. Jetty pointed out, development certainly comes with risk, but not nearly as much risk as not moving or moving too slowly. Our adversaries will take advantage of our slowness and not only reach technological superiority, but they will develop and export standards and norms for how those technologies are going to be used. For example, Chinese defense exports are up almost 40% over the past 10 years, mostly due to driving a different value system in how those technologies are deployed. For example, selling militarized, weaponized uh, uh, versions of predators and reapers to Middle Eastern countries. We simply can't afford to lose the upper hand in this battle. So with that, I'll, uh, I guess, end our standard comments. Any questions?
I'm Chaplain Andrew Shriver, CGSC student. I was wanting to know what advice would you give to those of us who are innovating in the Army? Um, it's an interesting time, I know, to be in the Army, but at the same time, there's a lot of unknowns, I guess, for the future. But right now, I help develop the expeditionary rifle stand to be used in memorials downrange. Uh, but I just was wondering what advice would you give to those of us who are innovating? Come see me right after this. Yes, sir. <laughs> cool, sir. Why don't, why don't you two both jump? <laughs> so this, this is a really poignant question, okay? Um, so um, so I have, I have a, I have, my daughter is the force mod officer for the 101st Airborne Division. It's kind of an interesting thing to have your daughter have the speed dial to the uh, acquisition executive. Uh, <laughs> So I just happened to be going out to, uh, uh, to visit her, she, and, uh, and, and um, in the process of doing that, I arrived at, at just a point where a, a, a unit innovator had gone down to the local college, used their maker's market to reproduce some things that I would, without discussing it too deeply here, probably wouldn't want to make sure that those things ended up in a file system that might be reachable by the um, over the internet. So I, I end up in this quandary uh, of trying to make sure that I, we want to encourage innovation and we want to make sure that we um, don't do something because we, we work with some things that have lots of energy uh, released very quickly. We have things that, uh, uh, that are made to kill people and break things. Um, and we also have a lot of people who work on things that uh, may not realize that that, that there are limitations to materials. I mean, just because you can print a bolt doesn't mean it'll hold that wheel on. Or if you use uh, ther uh, uh, thermal printing of a, a new hand grip for your rifle, um, if you haven't paid attention to the material's properties, y you could end up melting it onto your hand when you start firing the rifle and it gets too hot. And now you've got hot molten plastic stuck on your hand. So um, th the first thing is, we absolutely want to encourage innovative efforts from the inside of the military as well as from the out. The second thing is we're taking a look at a methodology by which we can provide you a facility to be able to try those things and make sure that we're not doing something unsafe. We don't want to stop you. We would ask you don't do anything that, that has anything to do with um, uh, energetics or weapons without making sure you first check with some, some of your safety people. And, that, uh, and, and we're going to try and put in place a, a mechanism by which if you can't make it, but you want it made, there's a, there's a way we can, can assist you in that. I just say, Chap, so, I mean, you're, what you just kind of described is exactly why I'm not sitting in the Pentagon, I'm sitting in Austin, Texas. So the ability to go out and bump into people like you that, that are looking at problems differently than what we would normally look at them, coming up with some innovative solutions, uh, probably something that we would not come up with on our own and probably wouldn't come up with working through traditional processes is exactly, I mean, you just described to a T exactly why we're in Austin and why um, we are interested, and that's why I said, come see me afterwards, and all the stuff Dr. Jetty talked about is absolutely true, and we can make all of that happen. Um, if you've got a great idea, we're interested. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Under Army Futures Command, uh, where will new requirements come from for material solutions that cross multiple cross-functional teams like tactical electric power? So the the one thing I didn't talk about in my opening remarks, which I think is, is very important. So requirements uh, in the past had bubbled up from the, 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 really from the centers of excellence, the CDIDs, the Center of Excellence, came together at ARCIC uh, and were prioritized in some way, came to the Department of the Army for funding. There was no prioritization to those requirements. So one of the key things in, in Army Futures Command, we, get, we talk about requirements and material, all, or we talk about material all the time. We very rarely talk about how requirements will work in the future. And what we are setting up is, is a really a, a process to where we start with national level guidance, the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, guidance from the Army senior leaders, the Army vision, for instance. Um, 
focus on a very specific enemy on a very specific piece of terrain, which we used to do really well before the wall went down, and then we kind of lost our focus when the wall went down, do some very sophisticated modeling and simulation, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of runs of different combinations, and identify the key gaps and the key opportunities that will allow us to win. And that's the key thing, allow us to win. And then I will provide the prioritization back down to the requirements generators on what we will write requirements against. And it will be focused on the Army's priorities, very, very, like with a laser focus uh, to make sure that we develop the capabilities we need to win on a future battlefield. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a two-part question regarding uh, relationships with innovators. There's a uh, perception among many of the innovations out uh, companies like Google or other companies out there that they may not want to work on the militarization of their technologies, uh, while on the other side there's this tension um, that they want to continue to have market access to what we see as our competitors, namely the market size of China. How are you going to reconcile building those relationships and maybe changing that cultural perception? Yeah. Thanks, buddy. The, uh... <laughs> You know, I, I, you, you used a key word there, relationship. You know, uh, really what the crux behind this whole effort is building stronger relationships and creating a platform for us to communicate to academia and business in a way that we've kind of slowed down or degraded over the last several decades. We've got to get out of the environment where we're hanging RFPs on websites. We've got to get out and communicate and forge relationships with a lot, I mean, all companies, so we can tap into the access into commercial markets. Big part of it is communication. So, uh, you know, I think that's where the challenge lies there. Um, but, you know, when you, in, in particular with really in Dr. Jetty's world, when you're working with a company that has a, a product that has a vast potential in a commercial market, you've got to have an IP strategy so that they can do both. Because we won't be able to compete in many places with the volume that they could have in the commercial side. So uh, a lot of the work that Dr. Jetty's done over the course of this last year with his IP strategy, having a very balanced approach, and a lot of that's communication. And so uh, if there's a military application that General Murray's uh, and the warfighters need, we have to be able to broker a deal. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort from senior leadership, and we are invested to do that. Speaking from the perspective... <clears throat> Sorry. Speaking from the perspective of... Uh, the tech community in Silicon Valley. Um, I actually think that the majority of the kind of energy that's coming out of places like Google opposing Project Maven, which it seems like most of you are probably familiar with, is coming from a, a really vocal minority. It's not that hundreds of thousands of people working at Google and Facebook oppose working with the Department of Defense. It's very low thousands. And um, the, those people are not they're not opposing it because they don't believe in securing the nation. They're probably mostly opposing it because they don't believe in the nation state at all. Um, and if you believe that we're all one global community, um, it becomes really hard to justify working on national security programs. So Sundar Pichai in a town hall um, actually said, wouldn't you rather a globalist company like Google work on these problems than a nationalistic defense contractor? And I think that those views are held in many, in many places. But you know, one when Google kind of pushed back on Maven, we had a lot of interest coming to other companies that were working on national security programs from people inside Google who thought that this was an important priority. So again, it comes back to what I was saying before. You, you, you have to create viable places for those people to go. Because right now, they don't feel, you know, if you can go and work at Google and make $500,000 a year as a 22-year-old graduate of Carnegie Mellon or Stanford or something, it's going to be pretty hard to convince you to not do that unless you feel like there's somewhere that has a growth trajectory that's believable. So I, I think that's the important thing that we need to be able to do. Thank you. Good afternoon, honorable sirs. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Mattia Zuzzi, Italian Army headquarters in Rome. I work at the Force and Capabilities Development um, branch as a Chief Modernization. Um, I have a question for you regarding the flow um, of uh, identificating the gap through the lessons learned process. How do you manage 
that virtual flow that allow us to, to identify the gaps and then uh, write the, the requirements for the new systems. Thank you. So it's, it's, it's not much more complicated than what I tried to describe. So 10 Joe Eric Wesley, uh, currently the, the director of ARCIC, will be the deputy commanders for future and concepts is what that organization will become when they come over to, to, to futures command. So starting with national level guidance, uh, you identify the gaps and then in uh, the opportunities. And, and it, it really, I think, key to this is the modeling and simulation. And, and, and history is important. Right, so your your concept of of uh, uh, lessons learned. So not only lessons learned from recent conflicts, but it's really a focus on on a near peer competitor type of conflict is what we haven't done for the last 15, 16 years. We've been focused on counterinsurgency. So applying that lens to it, and, and not just from a materiel standpoint. So it may be a, a constant, you know, change the way you fight will solve a lot of problems. Change how you're organized. So are there really going to be corps, divisions, brigades in U.S. Army 25 years from now? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and only go with a material solution when you need a material solution. And then really the first step is does that material solution exist today before you go to a, some sort of developmental program? And then capturing lessons learned through this process and then repeating them. Two paths you can go for a material solution, either exist today and you buy it or you go into uh, the traditional lab, whether that's basic and applied research or if it's developmental work in one of our engineering centers, or it's a technology that could be integrated, uh, maybe to exist today into an existing platform. I don't know if that answered your question. Okay. Thank you. I would add that the other step to that is that if there is not a commercial product that fits your requirements, you might need to adjust your requirements to, to right. modify back to a commercial product that does exist that will solve the problem. And, and Trey and I talked about this. So we, instead of a requirements document, maybe it's just a statement of the problem to, to a wide audience, not just defense industry, but innovators, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we might be surprised about the way other people would solve that problem. Hi, good afternoon. Janet Spruill. Uh, I'm with a small S&T research and development organization. Um, you alluded correctly to the challenge that we have in getting innovations into programs of record and into the hands of the warfighter. Um, could you speak specifically to methods that you intend to use to identify all of those points of innovation that could really help in terms of whether you plan to seed SBIR topics, issue broad agency announcements, work through consortia to issue calls that will result in OTAs and other perhaps innovation challenges. Yes, Would yes, appreciate your yes, thoughts. yes, and yes. <laughs> um, so I mean, uh, uh, any opportunity we have to, to get the problems we're trying to solve out to not only um, the labs and ST organizations that the Army uh, owns, but across a very broad spectrum, I think and, and really one of the biggest things we're after is, is, is different ways of looking at problems that we traditionally would look at in a very narrow sense, and it would end up in a requirements document that was a stretch for technology in many cases and, and would just never be solved. So all the, all the ways you described, um, and then the transition from, from basic science, applied science, uh, applied research into the traditional 6.3 through 6.7 dollars when he transitioned to a lab. Um, and I just got to be honest with everybody, we're going to be very, very focused in our efforts on aligning it against the Army's priorities. And that doesn't mean 100 um, percent. So we invest a lot of money right now in 6.162 basic and applied research. Um, and we have got, and most scientists hate to hear me say this, we have got to have a return on investment. Uh, and we want you working. Uh, and we, but we want you working on what's important to the Army. Um, and so, you know, lining against the Army's priorities all the way through uh, transition agreements with a PM or PEO, because if a technology is going to land someplace, the PM, PEO has to be ready to catch that. And thinking about it before it's a 6.7 or 6.8 or 6.9 technology to make sure we've got a path and a plan for that to be incorporated into a program or a couple key steps. So about uh, 11 months ago, I was out on your side of the, the, the table here, and uh, I was also a technology development company, my, my company was. Uh, I would tell you that there, 
we, we came in, wanted to make sure we've got an outreach program. We've got something called X Tech Search. I know that's an awkward name. I'm open to changing it. Please let me know if you've got a better idea. Shark Tank was taken, so I couldn't do that. Um, but, but that's fundamentally the concept. I want to open the door for you to bring in things that you can offer to us, offer to General uh, Murray and, and, uh, and, and his people, and let them see what opportunities there are. We're, and by the way, if you weren't down at uh, Innovator's Corner, which is another place you can get in if you've got something to offer and want people to see, um, uh, we, we made mention that uh, we're putting $2 million since June behind uh, the XTEC search, trying to find things that, uh, that could be applicable to these priorities that, that uh, General Murray's talking about. Um, we have a number of OTA consortia that are out there. Now, if you don't know what an OTA consortia is, I recommend you uh, get on, online and look it up. In short, uh, and you, you, you've got someone who's sort of a prime. Uh, their purpose is to manage the consortium. Uh, you have to join the consortium. That usually costs you a whopping probably $250 to $500. Uh, so I don't think it'll break the bank. If you're here, you probably paid that to get in. So you, you, you know, you, 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 we, we do some of this to, to comply with rules and regulations. You get into the consortium and you have an ability to write a white paper and you immediately have a contract vehicle if there's an interest on the part of um, uh, of, of the requirements community. And we've got other methods of funding these things in the short term for experimentation. So if you're looking for quick experimentation, quick ability to get the chance for the, for the, the, the military to get to you and take a look at your technologies, they're out there. Now, uh, and we have some other things, uh, uh, people out there hunting uh, for technologies. Uh, both, both in the uh, acquisition community and uh, in, in General Murray's community. Um, I'll tell you though, your biggest successes are going to be if you can help the military understand how your technical approach or your technology applies to those six big focus areas. Everybody can grab one of the green books uh, from AOSA, tells you all the weapon systems, tells you all the different pieces of how they're supposed to be working. You can begin projecting, you, you, you read some of these things. You need to study your marketplace if you want to sell into it, okay? Understand that you can, what you can know and say, hey, I think I can give you a leap ahead take technical capability by doing this, here's my product, and then offer it up. Don't assume that the person you're sitting across from who has spent their life developing their skills as a warfighter can necessarily see the insight in the specific application of your technology. So you need to do those things, not just wonder why they're not getting, you're not getting a response to a, an answer to an RFP. Uh, gentlemen, Dr. Bill Doe, University of Colorado, College of Engineering in Boulder, Colorado, and retired Army. Um, most of the talent you're looking for, a lot of it, is in your major research universities. And we have, I know you've got University of Texas in your backyard, but many other universities are working on cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, autonomy hundreds and hundreds of faculty every day working with funding from National Science Foundation, major other organizations. Just to put it in perspective, most of the faculty we're hiring were born in 1985 and 1990. Uh, they're doing the research you're talking about. Uh, they're not gonna read the, the uh, defense strategy. They're not going to read the pamphlets that you're putting out. Um, what are you going to do to reach out to them to get them to get interested in some of the projects you need because they are not necessarily looking for, um, you know, uh, they're looking for funding, but they're, they're incentivized by many other things. And it seems to me the challenge is for Futures Command to figure out ways to get to campus. Um, as an analog to that, the Air Force just conducted uh, hearing sessions at eight major universities this past summer to develop their 2030 S&T strategy. Uh, does Futures Command um, foresee doing things like that so that our academic faculty who don't know anything about the Department of Defense can contribute to the technologies you're talking about. Austin and uh, UT are a start. It's not uh, an end point. So yes, uh, I got a trip to Stanford at the end of this month and, and I was, somebody brought up I thought was a pretty novel uh, idea in terms of getting into the university systems is we've got ROTC departments 
at just at a large number of universities and so for an access point. And the ROTC students of today, I just sat with a bunch of them from The Ohio State University um, the other day. Um, I, had, I, had to, I had to do it. Um, they're, they're not the commercial marketing majors that I was when I went to college. I mean, they're engineers uh, that, are, that are going through ROTC. They're not interested as much in the infantry as I was. They're interested in, in the, the, really the, the technical pieces of the Army. Um, and so I think there's a natural entry point to, to a lot of universities uh, across the nation uh, to get into them and, and start working with really the, the, the faculty there and, and as importantly the students there. And we're working through a process right now which could apply uh, well outside of UT in, t in terms of some sort of interim, pro interim program where we could bring on uh, promising young students or faculty that are interested in, in coming to work for us for three, four, five, six, seven months, whatever they can afford in terms of a sabbatical to help us really get after hard problems. And, I, and that's the kids I talk to today, that's what it's about is, is they want a hard problem they can solve and make a contribution and move on to the next problem. And so we are open to just about any idea uh, to include coming out to Colorado uh, and a lot of other places because, like I said, Austin UT is, is really just kind of a start point for us. I would, can, can I add to that? I would also add that MD5 uh, has a program called Hacking for Defense uh, that facilitates basically courses, semester-long courses, where problems are submitted by the military that are then worked on as projects by, uh, by members of the class. Uh, Founders Fund has been hosting the finals, like the demo day finals for that. Um, and I've seen some really interesting stuff coming out of it. As far as commercialization, I would propose that we need a date a billionaire option for these <laughs> university students. We can't help you with that. <laughs> Carl Wheeler, I'm a prior infantryman. Now I'm a virtual reality startup founder and investor. Uh, and uh, in the spirit of Peter Thiel, Mr. Stevens, I was curious, uh, if you could tell us something that you find to be true, uh, but few other people in your industry find to be true. Wow, someone read zero to one. That's really good. Uh, for, for context, for those of you that don't have any idea what he's talking about, um, one of my partners at Founders Fund is Peter Thiel, who is one of the founders of PayPal, who then went on to found Palantir. And he often asks an interview question, what is something you believe to be true at the, about the world that most of your peers do not agree to be true with? Um, to be honest, like as a partner at Founders Fund, I have to have lots of answers to that question um, because it kind of constantly comes up. Um, the, the, the one that's specific to the defense industry is, uh, is this program of record kind of thing that I've been beating the dead horse on here, which is ju just that without transition to program, uh, there isn't life for startups in defense. That, that's that one. Um, maybe like a more... Uh, a more controversial one is that this is a zero-sum game. Not everyone can win. In order for a new entrant to the market to win, someone has to lose. And a lot of you probably work for those people that have to lose. So I won't name any names, but this is definitely a zero-sum game. We can't get you to come back? Sir? We can't get you to come back to work for us? <laughs> See me afterwards. <laughs> We're recruiting, buddy. I'm going to come find you. Henry Merhoff, are you familiar with or aware of Project Vulcan? It is an operator-focused database sponsored by SOCOM, which allows companies like ours to insert technology for consideration and use by special ops operators. It took me six months to enter a Project Vulcan and a demonstration. It has taken me over three years to get the same reaction. We'll be participating in the Army's 
uh, expeditionary warrior experiment in April of next year. As a former OTC operational tester, I find the lag not nice. <laughs> and so I'm happy to see the Army taking steps, but you've got a long way to go. Well, after I see the other guy, I'll come find you after. <laughs> <laughs> General Murray, Felicia Campbell from the Greater Los Angeles Chapter of AUSA, and I'm going to go back to the education question. And I think one of the resources that you have are local chapters. When you come out and visit us, we support four ROTC battalions, 30 colleges in Southern California, and we can connect you with all of them, and it includes little schools like USC, UCLA, Chapman College, and some other minor universities. So I look forward to having you join us next year. And I think that using the local chapters to connect to the universities is a good step for you. As well as the CASAs that are out there. As well as we have four now. Yep, yep. Sirs, uh, Dr. Daniel Zahn, MITRE Corporation. And you talk about agility and speed and development with the future command and the acquisition process. But I was wondering, what are your thoughts about maintaining our intellectual property from our adversaries so that our overmatch is not just a delta time before our adversaries catch on because they're able to infiltrate and penetrate our networks and be able to exfiltrate that data, that intellectual property data, back to their countries? Yeah, so this is, this is one of the difficulties of free society. Um, a large portion, you know, you ju we just had the discussion with the universities. Uh, want to use more universities, want to get more things developed, want, want the free thinking of universities. Universities have rights to publish. So anything we fund potentially inside of a university becomes an issue of, of open publication. Uh, a second, second part of that problem, and, and, and one we're actually wrestling with right now, is, is if I, if I if I grant to a university, let's say $10 million, um, they can spend that the way they want. Uh, I recently discovered that uh, uh, on a, that, uh, that one particular university was spending uh, a large portion of the money we had granted to them to fund uh, graduate studies for, for uh, let's just say, a lot of foreign students and very few US citizens. Um, when, I, when I wrestled with that, I came, ran into the problem we have conflicting laws. I can't tell, I can't spend the money funding foreign graduate students, but they can't be told who they can spend the money on. So we end up over on Capitol Hill with these things. So there's, there's this exposure that's unintended consequence of some other laws that, that we, particularly at the fundamental research level, um, when we start to get up a little higher in the IP food chain, when you're talking about things that actually belong to corporations, companies, LLCs, those type of things, the control over that IP becomes a question of licensing and exclusive licensing, ownership, and those type of things, something the military is terrible at. Um, and so we've run, uh, written an ex excuse me, an extensive uh, IP policy uh, that, as you might suspect, has been spending a lot of time going back and forth with the lawyers uh, so that we can, in fact, get better control over those pieces of IP that we do fund and that probably should be better protected so that we can control who, who finds out about it. Now, on the other hand, if, if it's clearly IP of, you know, I've got the special chewing gum that sticks all tank treads in the, in the dirt, and you, you know, once they run over it, they stop right there. Um, those things we can pretty well protect fairly easily. Uh, but, but IP is a very, very leaky system and a very difficult thing unless you have a specific programmatic issue you, you are protecting as a program. 
I don't know if that helps, but it kind of gives you a little bit better understanding of the landscape we wrestle with. Thank you. First, uh, I commend you guys for uh, trying to change the system that, as you know, I'm all too familiar with. Uh, so if you change the requirements process and you streamline that under General Murray, you use all the acquisition authorities that Congress has given you to streamline that part under Dr. Jetty, who I'll also note that fail fast sounds really good. Even be successful slow, like the program that you had uh, before you came back to the government, Ryan. Uh, that sounds great until you're all sitting up there in front of that committee explaining why <laughs> it is what it is. But my question's on, all that's great. How do you work that with the traditional budgeting process that doesn't give you that road to uh, program addicts? Uh, you know, it seems to be working now for the first year in a long, long time, but there's no, no guarantee that that's going to continue. And my expectation is that budgets are going to become more compressed again in the near future. So how do you make the dynamic work within that environment? Well, I'm a little optimistic. I got it on time this year. <laughs> That's for, I mean, God, you're bringing me down, Alan. I'm uh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> we worked really hard last year to get that done. Um, <laughs> it's been sitting next to General Murray all those years when it was tougher. Yeah, that's right. Not <laughs> that's right. Um, so we're blessed with the 18-19 budget deal. I mean, a $22.5 billion increase, it's, it's extraordinary. And we're very grateful for that. But uh, like I alluded to, not so... Um, delicately earlier was uh, this leadership team will make the decisions necessary to finance our 21 signature systems, whatever it takes. And Alan, <clears throat> it's good to see you, by the way. Um, I, I, there, there's, there's a lot of things between the Army and Congress, and one of them is a lack of trust. And so I, I think we've got a lot of work to do to build some the trust back up between the Congress and, and the United States Army. And, and we would... You're right. I mean, there is there is no flexibility in, in you know, I, I can't tell you today when I want, what I want to be prototyping in 2021, which is the way our system kind of works. Um, and Congress right now has a hard time with anything they kind of see as a slush fund, and, and rightfully so. Um, but we've got a lot of fences to repair and a lot of trust to rebuild uh, with the Congress to give us that type of flexibility. Not a lot of money, but a lot of some money with some flexibility so we can see something very innovative and prototype uh, and, and take it to failure early or take it to the next step. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Sir, that was a really interesting interaction that we had with our former infantryman turned uh, VR entrepreneur. Um, Don't let him go. I'm going to go talk to him. After. So, sir, to that point, um, he is not the only one. Uh, there are many in this room and not in this room and not at this conference uh, that are veter veteran military officers, NCOs, et cetera. Um, and they're working, in they're working in innovation in an ecosystem either for academia um, or for industry, myself included. Uh, some of us still wear a uniform um, two days a month. Uh, is there a way to leverage what we learn over the other 30 days a month um, when we put the uniform on and work for you? So are you a National Guard or Arm U.S. Army Reserve? Correct, sir. Pennsylvania National Guard. Okay. Uh, you interested in joining the Army Reserve? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a load of questions. So... Sitting right here in the front row is Major General Bo Young, um, and as part of, um, he commands the 75th Innovation Command, United States Army Reserve, direct support to Army Futures Command. Brand new organization, used to be the 75th Training Command, and he is trying to capitalize on exactly uh, what it is that you're talking about. So I think they're probably about 150 strong right now, maybe a little less than that, maybe a little more. I haven't really checked recently with the goal of growing that organization over time to go out and find exactly the, you know, what you're talking about and bring them back into the U.S. Army Reserve as tech scouts uh, to help us find the talent we're after, to help us find the technologies that's happening in places like Chicago and Los Angeles and New York City and Boston. Uh, that's where these small U.S. Army Reserve units will be located. Um, and he's also building this very slowly to make sure we build this right the first time. Uh, and to capitalize on exactly what you're talking about is is those out there wearing uniform, whether it's 365 days a year or two weeks a month or two days a month, um, that that are in this space that can help us along. Roger that, sir. I'll sit down now. Then. My name is Emma Toops. I'm the chapter president of Greater Kansas City AUSA chapter. 
And about 15 years ago, I was the force mod officer for 3rd Brigade, 4th Infantry D Division. And when I was in company command, I saw um, my command transform with the BCT transformation of the, of the Army. So my question is to General Murray and is a force structure clarification. My understanding of the Futures Command is that it's a strategic level command that is to focus on creating efficiencies and expediting requirements, R&D, procurement, and acquisition. And what I'd like to have clarified is the actual force mod impl implementation of the solutions developed. Is that something that is going to be a subcomponent of Futures Command, or is it going to be handed off to Forcecom to uh, deliver to the field in, as far as fieldings and training and cycle through TRADOC as far as a feedback mechanism as to whether or not the solutions are what we want or need. Were you an FA-50? I was a chemical officer, sir. Okay, you're just working in the force mod piece. Um, so, yes, so underneath the, one of the sub subordinate commands called Futures and, and Concepts, will, will be called Futures and Concepts when they come over to AFC, is the piece you're talking about, the traditional force modernization, force mod, force management function of not only materiel, but it's also organizational structures. Um, and, and I mentioned this, I think, in, in either a question or open remark. So, you know, is modularity the right organizational construct for the Army going forward? We've been a, a modular Army since 2005 when I brought a brigade back from Iraq and we changed it. Um, there were a lot of good reasons for going to a modular design. Is that still the right path forward, or we need to go back some sort of echelon of, of responsibilities? And if you're going to echelon responsibilities on a future battlefield, do you echelon capabilities to meet those responsibilities? That will be done inside of Army Futures Command. Um, the, the concepts of how we fight, not, not the doctrine necessarily of how we fight, but the concepts of how we fight and will fight into the future based upon a very deep look into what we expect the future operational environment to look like, a very deep look into near peer, potentially peer adversaries, their modernizations past, what we expect them to be capable of a, at a point in the future. All that gets done inside of Army Futures Command. Now, the dot mil PF integration you're talking about uh, is still a responsibility of TRADOC. So I'm responsible for future force. TRADOC re remains responsible for current force. So somewhere around the end of a FIDEP, give or take, you know, window of three or four years, as a concept matures, as an organizational construct matures, as a material solution matures, it gets handed off. Um, not the material, but the other two, two trade-off for integration into leader development, into training strategies for applications to combat training centers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, okay. thank you, sir. Yep. Sirs, thank you. I'm excited uh, about the prospects here, um, but I was excited when ADA was going to be the programming standard for DOD. Um, <laughs> But uh, my question really is around governance. Um, I was active duty. Um, I was, went into industry after that and recently retired from Dr. Jetty's organization last year. And the biggest problem is, is not the great ideas. It's getting the people to agree. Uh, when I was on active duty, my company commander would give me a five-paragraph op order and there was something called unity of command, and we discuss it, but after that, the time for good ideas was done, and there was one guy in that room that could say yes and make it stick. And if I were ever going to write a PhD thesis, and I won't, so don't wait up, but it would be on the topic of why are there 500 people, and it's not just in DOD, it's in IT in general, that can say no and make it stick, and there's not one person, including as far as I can tell, the four people up here on stage that can say yes and make it stick, actually come to a, to a conclusion on that. And so how, are we, how is this going to be different moving forward from a governance standpoint and hopefully drive to some sort of unity of command uh, construct? Thank you. Um, while we've had success over the last years because we've compressed the number of layers of people involved and compressed the timelines. But that Secretary Esper and General Milley have had the will to make the decisions. 
I mean, you can hear about blue ribbon panels on acquisition for decades, synchronize, integrate, coordinate. It's exhausting. At weapon systems development is about will, to make a decision. So uh, it comes down to the four people in our hallway when they tee these up. We've reduced the number of layers for deliberation, and we're making decisions. With that comes consequence. But uh, there's, you can refine a governance process to death. It does come down to leadership. So that's what we're trying to do, just very simply. And I would, I would also, so the, the number of people that can say no. Um, so we, we used to do a little thing called worldwide staffing, uh, at least two turns of it in a requirements process. And usually when you do worldwide staffing, you come back with about 875 comments, which we felt inclined to adjudicate 875 comments, and you end up building a camel uh, when you make 875 people happy. Um, that that is pretty much gone. So, what the secretary mentioned was really the CFTs had a direct link into um, the big four decision making, and, that, and that's how we were able to do a three to five week uh, requirements pool. Not everybody's happy. Uh, we still have the UN, but there's also a thing called the Security Council. So some votes count more than others. Um, and, and the group I would add into that also, and I mentioned this, I think, in my prepared remarks, is the partners I have in this. So the force comm commander has a vote in the requirements process and the acquisition process. The TRADOC commander, the AMC commander, of course, <clears throat> Dr. Jetty and uh, has a vote. Um, but ultimately, uh, as the secretary mentioned, it is primarily uh, General McConville and Secretary McCarthy have been driving this process and driving organizations to yes in a very quick, uh, or no, but it's quick either way. Real, real quick. So um, I think that there's always been, uh, or there for a long time has been this uh, idea that uh, there's the acquisition piece and then there's like what whatever this requirement stuff is. And uh, I will tell you that I came in, I came into the, to the position and I got out with my PEOs and PMs and I've, I've spent time with them. And one of the things that I made made clear, and I continue uh, to make clear at every opportunity, is that our objective is to enable the warfighter. As senior leaders have, have uh, as uh, uh, Secretary McCarthy has said, are very tightly bound on uh, what, where they want to go, what they want to do. They've, they've listed the top six, uh, and they've put CFTs in place to try and get these things accomplished. They've moved budgets around uh, to, to try and uh, uh, accomplish to fund it, uh, and they've dealt with the challenges over on the hill when you go back and tell them, hey, you know, I wanted to have money here, I want to put it over there. Uh, the role of the acquisition community is to be responsive. Uh, we're, I, I, I've told my guys, it, it says alpha and omega, it doesn't, it, it should be changed to no commission, okay? We, we don't get commission for what we produce. I don't get a benefit for a specific item. What I get is a benefit when we produce things that are in line with what the warfighters' needs are. And that's how we're going to stay focused. And I think just to add to that, it's one of the mo what more powerful things about this organization is, it, you know, in the past, it was, you know, it was us and them. It was the requirements guys and it was the acquisition guys and, and there was a lot of this going on. It's no longer them and us, it's we, right? So if you're all part of one organization driving towards one goal, deliver capability to our soldiers on time that will save lives on a future battlefield. And that's the only goal we're gonna measure ourselves against. And if we have to be in sync and working towards that same goal together, I think that's a pretty powerful statement. Thank you. Sir, Dave Prasad with uh, Insight uh, Small Business. Um, how do you guys plan to level the playing field between the large and small businesses? And what I mean by that, I can innovate and produce a product but I might not have the resources to put it out there in the field where large companies can go right to a unit today with their product and then start providing field service support as they try and do DevOps right off the bat without being going through a program. Thanks, I can start first. I can start. Um, so we're working through that right now. There's a, an organization that's in Austin with me called the Army Applications Lab and, and we're trying to work through that not only from a you know, a, a very uh, immature technology standpoint, but from a small business standpoint, uh, to provide the opportunities you're talking about. Because the one thing 
that most small businesses can't afford to invest in is is infrastructure and access to soldiers. But the Ar there's one thing the Army has a lot of, it's infrastructure and access to soldiers. I don't know if Paul Funk's in here or not, but I'm, I'm, he's gonna be tired of seeing me up at Fort Hood uh, just because it's so close. So we can work, I mean, and the other thing, powerful thing about the CFTs we haven't mentioned is they have a partnered uh, core or division uh, for each of the CFTs. So, and I don't know which one I see Gary Valeski sitting out there. I don't know which one you got, Gary, but if CFT director needs access to, to put equipment in, I said that several times, the, the putting it in the hands of soldiers and getting that direct feedback, the DevOps model you mentioned is absolutely critical to the way we're going forward. But they call Gary Valeski and they get time on a range with soldiers to provide that feedback. And, and each one of the CFTs has that relationship. Um, and I kind of, uh, whether General Funk likes it or not, we'll establish that relationship with Fort Hood. Um, and so that's one of the things we're focused on. Access to labs, access to infrastructure, access to soldiers. So if you've got a, and there'll be a screening process, so not everybody gets that, right? But if you've got a good idea that we're interested in, we'll absolutely help you with that. Yeah, so uh, a, a couple of real quick points. One is, uh, we have something called CRADA's Cooperative Research and Development Agreements. I will tell you that I'm, I, I, I think it's a good idea and I think it's a difficult idea for small companies um, because I, I've had difficulty uh, using it, um, mostly because it's someplace else and then I've got to go there uh, and that's TDY money or travel money and that type of thing. We're looking at whether or not we can facilitate small business uh, travel expenses in association with uh, CRADAs. Uh, probably sometime we'll, we'll, we'll tell you one way or another whether that's acceptable or not in, in the next year. But I do want to see if we can find a way to do that. The, the, the military, the government has a huge number of assets available for your use through the CRADA system. We have, I, I needed to measure 0.1 part per million sulfur. I could find one machine to do that and it happened to be in the government lab. It wasn't being used, but I had to get my stuff there, okay? So these type of resources are, are out there if, if you want to pursue them, uh, just, just like being, getting access to soldiers uh, is. Um, a second piece I would tell you, and this is, this is kind of one small business owner to another, um, when you capture something with the prototyping fund or some, some other thing within the military, the day you win that, you start working on part two, which is the application of that. Because you can assume that you're going to be successful. You're going to get the prototype. It's going to work in whatever prototyping environment. But like, like you've all said, it's, it's nice to sell one or two. Now what do I do? Okay? And I know that the you know, it's not how much money you have as a small business. It's the cash, it's the first derivative. It's the cash flow. How much is coming in, how much is going out, and, and which one's above what. Um, so if you don't do that planning right from the beginning as to what you're going to do if you succeed and then begin working on it, knowing that it takes us a while to get things in, on contract, uh, because Frankly, we've got a lot of bureaucratic laws and things that make it difficult to just snap our fingers. I could put things on contract as a private citizen in a day because I wanted to and it was my money. I've got the public's money at hand and I've got a lot of responsibilities as to how I have to follow certain sets of rules. Some things are faster than the other. The closer you get to a real contract with real money behind it, the more help we get. So you, you, you need to plan with us on those things. Yeah, these are, these are all great points and absolutely correct. Uh, the other thing that oftentimes gets overlooked in my experience at least is that there are a lot of technologies out there that are absolutely ready to go. Like they're shippable, we can use them today, um, but are uneconomical for large businesses to, to invest in due to how quickly, easily, and cheaply they can be deployed. So as a small business, if you can identify what some of those categories are, low-cost autonomous systems, low-cost applied artificial intelligence. Um, you know, we're not talking about building Skynet. We're talking about easy, simple things that we can, they can add a lot of value at very low cost. You don't even have to worry about competing with large companies because they're not going to be interested in, in working on those, so. 
Hello, I'm Doug Greenlaw from Research Innovations, a small technology company growing about 80% a year doing some agile work. Um, and this has been a great panel. Thank you so much for showing the unity of leadership that you have. Uh, a hallmark of commercial business is speed and agility. This is at odds with how the DOD acquisition process has traditionally worked. And companies like mine are developing some innovative and agile solutions through organizations like the OSD SCO and DIU and with the uh, OTA process that Dr. Jetty described, which is fantastic. Um, you know, we, we can put out multiple versions of software a month, kind of the commercial model, not traditionally the DOD model. That kind of a model threatens the program of record acquisition process and test process. How can you leverage these to support the culture change that you need to achieve for your vision for Army modernization? Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> um, so the only thing I'm tripping on is, is the leverage. I mean, so that, that is actually going on right now in terms of, and the testing piece of it kind of threw, threw me a little bit too. So I, I think, I mean, ultimately we got to show some success um, and that's what everybody's kind of waiting on for, for AFC to kind of show some success into leveraging OTAs, into leveraging the authorities I've been given to prioritize test schedules and, and work that uh, our test community does. It doesn't include um, dot and &E, but for everything Army Test and Evaluation Command does, I prioritize their ranges, I prioritize their workload. And, and surprisingly enough, they are prioritized against the Army's six uh, modernization priorities. Um, it, and ultimately, I mean, I, I think you really start to, to change the culture um, when you show the output we're after. Uh, and we're not there yet. I mean, there's a couple things on the horizon to kind of take advantage of the tools that you're talking about. Uh, non-traditional uh, approaches to acquisition, non-traditional approaches to requirements, non-traditional approaches to contracting, and showing a fairly rapid turn and a quick win for our soldiers. And I think momentum will build upon early success uh, and momentum will build upon momentum over time. I Matt, mean, I don't have a better answer than that. Okay, thank you, sir. So a um, couple of things. First, uh, people who have to execute uh, programs or records are not bad people. <laughs> uh, they, they have a lot of, uh, a lot of um, requirements levied on them, not, not the type that uh, General Murray's talking about, but, but compliance issues. So it is a difficult uh, environment to, to negotiate uh, in, a, in a rapid fashion, but it's, it's still doable. At the same time, I, I, I've told my people that um, this is a leadership issue on my part, and I'm trying to address it. Uh, programs or records, a, a PM is told, cost, schedule, performance, risk, show me your program, show me your program plan, comply with that program plan, report on that program plan, you get a glide path, and somebody walks in the door with a better doohinkey. And that, that person, the PM goes, go somewhere else. Yeah. And, and that's because this is disruptive to the program. We, on the one hand, beat him about the head and shoulders, tell him to make sure he complies with all of that glide path, and then turn around a week later and say, why didn't you include the new doohinkey in your plan? That's my fault, okay? That's because I don't have a program in place to facilitate that program manager coming in and say, hey, this new doohinkey would give us this. Let's go talk to General Murray's people about whether or not that's worthwhile. Then we come back and he says, by the way, if you want me to put it in, it's going to cost this much money right. and it's going to take that much time. So are you willing to take a slip of six months, 12 months? Are you willing to come up with, you know, $20 million to do the transition and insertion because you, we just, you just screwed with my program or record. And, and we haven't, we don't have a vehicle to do that. So we've been trying to figure out a way that the General Murray and I can put together a, a methodology by which we deliberately decide, yes, I, your, your doohinkey is worth it for that POR. And, or your, your doohinkey, we can't afford to put it in the POR right now. It's something good. The next transition point is gonna be in three years, and we, we can't do anything for three years, and let you know honestly, instead of tagging you along. And a lot of that's how we, how we feel too, right? So just take next generation combat vehicle. Um, 
left our own devices, we'll make a decision on what that vehicle looks like, and we'll field the same vehicle for the next 16 years. Why do I need to wait 16 years to go to a block upgrade? Why can't I do that every two years as technology is mature? It drives the logisticians crazy because you've got different versions of the, of the same vehicle out there. But I think there's different ways of acquiring stuff uh, that we could almost modernize in stride as we go. Exactly. Good afternoon. Ken Bobu with Thursby Software Systems. I have a question for you that's slightly different. Um, the program to which you alluded, Doctor, uh, the uh, Shark Tank, the Air Force put one of those on. It was, they called it the Spark Tank. Uh, we did very well there, uh, and we ended up with 30,000 users for, uh, to run our products there. We have 50,000 in the Navy Reserve. So for a company that's not at the stage of complete beginners, uh, what kind of an informality are you going to have, given that you guys are only a couple of hours down the road from where we are in Dallas-Fort Worth, what kind of informality do you have for people who want to come and talk to you about a product that's already out there? It's being utilized already. It's already passed those thresholds, but that is not currently being utilized within the Army. So I'm looking at uh, a, a different capability. I think we're talking about two different things. Right now, in a very same setting. Where I was exposed to that was a place called the Capital Factory in, in Austin, Texas, which is as about as informal as you can get. Um, <laughs> and enough. Jay Harrison was here standing right there against the wall. I call him out all the time. He is he is the, my chief innovator in the Army Applications Lab. He's got people hanging out in Capital Factory right next to AFWorks, right next to SoftWorks, and right next to DIU. I guess SoftWorks is not there yet, but the other AFWorks and DIU is there. And what we're doing in the Capital Factory to get after just what you're talking about is the three military-related innovation organizations on one floor. So it's almost like a uh, government DOD space uh, out of a five-floor uh, organization. Innovators, small startup companies, mature companies that have a solution to offer us. I mean, we're open for business basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week in that location. Thank you. I'm John Rose. I support a service-disabled, veteran-owned small business. The men and women that are going to operate the systems that you're now envisioning deploying, to what extent are you thinking through or doing research on how those men and women that are just being born today or very, very young, how they think, how they're going to react, how they're going to be trained, how they're going to essentially function in, uh, in the Army with this new equipment. Yeah, I, I would argue a lot of them haven't even been born yet, but, but I, I agree with you 100%. So one of the things that the Army used to do uh, fairly well is, is human systems integration and, and that ability to kind of look into the future and, and and predict some of that. We, we basically got rid of all of that, so part of that is the talent, and I haven't talked at all about talent and the talent search that I'm on right now, but part of that is not only understanding what the future might look like, because we won't get it right, or what the equipment of the future might look like, we won't get it exactly right, but start to make some predictions. Um, you know, in 1986 when I was a company commander with my Tandy 2000, I couldn't imagine an iPhone, but but we've got to start making some of those bets um, and some, develop some of that understanding, knowing we won't get it right, uh, but we've got to get it more right than wrong. Thank you. And a younger workforce. Uh, I see us breaking the stovepipes down here in the Army, but the technology that, my name's Ken Napier, I'm sorry. Uh, the technology we're talking about is no longer just a weapon system, or it's no longer an item. It's a, it's a piece of, it's an entity, it's AI, it's a piece of software, or a unique energy controller, or something that is a piece of a component of a component that a small company has that is extremely unique and developed for a commercial aspect, maybe, that is a, applicable here. But it's not only applicable to the Army, it's applicable to the Air Force, it's applicable to the Navy, and it has interest to DOD labs, it has interest to other entities. So how do you, how do you, as you start to break the stovepipe down within the Army, how do we get our sister services and how do we get DOD involved in the same initiative? And that then brings us back to potentially becoming better stewards with Congress because we're then going after the congressmen that have Air Force entities in their states 
our Navy ports, and we're working across the board. Right now, we're very blessed that the, the relationships we have with the other services have gone very well. We're investing to, together on hypersonics. We're looking at how we're going to do that with artificial intelligence. We've just established an Army task force on this. Um, but this, one of the challenges you face is in compressed budget environments. So if we, if you head down the path to Budget Control Act, it becomes, you know, you start heading down the path of the Hunger Games. Uh, so, you, you know, we are, and we're very blessed because also a lot of the leaders like General Murray and others have served in combat alongside these folks for the last 17 years. So when the war kicked off in 01, they're all flag rank officers now. They've all served together in multiple echelons. So there's a, there's a tremendous power and synergy and relationships that we have in the department right now. Uh, and it's, it's created a lot of opportunity for us. But um, the, some of the signature uh, systems that we just, we just talked about, uh, we are doing it jointly, but there are always challenges with joint programs. So a lot of the ways we're addressing is in joint interest. So that if you can work with these together along timelines that meet your needs, uh, that's the way we've gone through this approach. But uh, it's, a, it's something that it requires a tremendous amount of time and energy with senior leaders because we go to war differently. You and think uh, so the challenge is still, a lot of times as you get closer to production, mass production, you start to splinter. So, and I just add, so a lot of times, as I've said several times, concepts will drive requirements. And the fact that Eric Wesley's sitting down at Fort Eustis and ACC is just up the road to Langley in charge of Air Force requirements. And so as we work on joint concepts, that will drive a lot of requirements for both, in this case, the Army and the Air Force, um, which will expose uh, capabilities that each service has that may be useful. And, I, for one, think that, you know, if the Navy or the Air Force has already developed something and I can avoid all the rdt and &E and all the testing uh, expenses that go into that, we, the Army just ought to go with the, the capability they've got. I mean, there's some very capable systems uh, in it. I don't want, I don't want the F-35, but there are some capable technologies in the Air Force and the Navy that we ought to be capitalizing on as opposed to trying to and we're trying very hard to get away from it wasn't built here, therefore it's no good uh, mentality in a lot of ways. Specifically, if I could jump in, specifically regarding the, the software question, I think this is a really interesting kind of paradigm shift um, because when you can touch and feel something or you can see a human sitting in a chair doing something, there's like a pretty easy way to, to evaluate the, the cost and the value that that's providing. Like you kind of have an understanding of what the, the margin is going to be on, you know, buying an aircraft carrier. Um, it's really hard to do this with software. As it turns out, software has a marginal cost of basically zero. So it, it costs a company nothing to just ship enormous amount of volume of software. Um, and psychologically, I think this is really challenging for, for all enterprises, not just the Defense Department. You know, for example, when I was in high school, I never would have thought of, to, like, go into a Walmart and steal a music CD. But a year later, when I was in college, I downloaded an infinite amount of music on Napster, and I felt no remorse. It was just like, it's software, it's ephemeral, it's not real, it doesn't really count. And I think there has to be a paradigm shift mentality where we're willing to pay for the value that that software is providing. And this is especially important when it's cross-service, um, because you can eke out an enormous amount of value by sharing the cost of that. Like one example is we paid hundreds, we the American taxpayer, paid hundreds of millions of dollars to custom build the defense travel service, which is a bad version of Concur. We could have very easily just bought Concur, but psychologically there's something in our mind where we're like, we'd much rather pay hundreds of million dollars to have butts in seats writing code than we're willing to pay for a marginal cost of zero that's going to make someone really wealthy. And we have to get past that. A lot of our challenge is that we are cost-centric in how we approach deals. It's very easy to quantify. It's very easy for us to explain to Congress and others. Uh, but value is quite another. So it's, it's a lot harder to do. And it, I agree with you 100%. But it's a challenge that we have uh, culturally. Sir, uh, gentlemen, if you don't mind, I have two questions to this. So with the understanding that new systems can be built with AI, or excuse me, with the understanding that new systems can be built with AI in mind, what is your plan to tackle AI with legacy systems? 
where bolting on AI is much more difficult and usually you don't get the results that are needed, specifically with machine learning and deep learning. Is that, is that one or you got another one too? Well, the second one is your talent management that you were addressing. I want to know, for especially for us in Green Suit, what is your plan to have uh, talent management within AI? Um, so I'll take the second one first, and then I think Dr. J and I can probably tag team on the, on the first one. So the first part of any talent management program is identifying the talent, right, which the, the, the Army's human resource system right now does a very, very poor job. So um, I've got a stack of ORBs on my desk of uh, people that worked at, in, still in uniform, that have worked at DARPA at any capacity in the past. That's one of the things I've asked to look at. I've also got a stack of ORBs, and these ORBs are pretty thin. I mean, this is not a very big stack uh, of people with PhDs in data sciences. Um, I've got a stack of ORBs uh, with people that are graduates of places like MIT or Carnegie Mellon. So that's really kind of where we're, we're starting uh, to look at. And I, I think I talked about this in testimony. I walked in my Crystal City, I actually had three offices. My Crystal City office I walked into, um, and there was a young man in this case standing there. He had a CIB on, he had a Ranger tab, he had a combat patch, and, and I thought he had jump master wings. I said, this is my type of guy. I, mean, I can talk to him. He also has a PhD in data sciences. Um, so that is not my type of guy. Um, <laughs> but that's exactly the type of people I need on both the military and the commercial or the, the civilian side of it because um, I, I would be the first one to admit I am not smart enough to do this on my own, so I have got to hire the right people with those types of backgrounds that can help me kind of get through this. So from a technology standpoint, uh, from a, and, and it's really understanding, and, and people will wince when I say this, I mean, there's, I get a thousand people have, to, I've got a stack, of, I do have a stack of a thousand business cards in the last two weeks. Not all of that is useful for me to follow up on and work on. So who can help me kind of figure out, you know, the technologies I should be focused on, um, the, the systems engineering, which I don't, I mean, I'm a commercial marketing major, so some help with, I mean, can even if, your first question, even if it's a really, really good idea, can it be integrated and can it be scaled? And so hiring those type of people, whether they're in uniform, which is great because you're easy to hire, I just call HRC and you're there a week later, or if I gotta go find that in the in the commercial uh, space, is 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 very important. And, and it's something I've been charged with is you know developing uh, AFC leadership 10, 15, 20 years down the road, which I'm very focused on. It's going to be very non-traditional in how we do this. I think AI on legacy systems. I mean, you you that that is the hardest route if you plan for it from the beginning. Incorporation of even machine learning or AI. That's actually the easy part, so, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Jetty, but I, I think very narrow applications can go into legacy systems. So I, I yeah, a lot, a lot of our legacy systems are difficult to put AI in them. Um, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, consider some of our sighting systems and the sites then are, are basically cameras with TVs at the back end of them. There's no place in the middle of it where the computers could be put in there. We, we have ways we could potentially break the link between the front end camera and, and the back end uh, display and then filter it through a, a computer where we could run an AI program on it just like your little cell phone can find your face in that big background of morass. Um, but to do that, it becomes a question of whether or not it's cost effective because our systems are so tightly integrated, particularly the ones you're probably referring to, like weapon systems. They're so tightly integrated for such small spaces. I, I was a tanker. You look at the outside of a tank, think there's a lot of room in the tank. There's no room in the tank. So if I start taking things apart and sticking new stuff in there, I get people really grumpy. So we really end up having to move from the legacy product to the new product. And, and so that's kind of the approach, I think, on the larger part we're going to pursue. Talks, on the other hand, are a little bit different, and we have been developing and leveraging commercial software and common systems in, in talks, and uh, I think that the, the, the part there is, is, is we need the talent to help employ that, because we can slide, we, we've got inputs coming in, 
We've got display pieces and management pieces on the front end, that slice in the middle where we could slide in some artificial intelligence to help that young captain figure out what that pile of messages that have just run by him or her was. Where, where was the pony in the pile there? That AI application, it's not just that I can stick a piece of software in there. I need the talent base to figure out how to tune that software to find the pony I'm looking for. And, um, and, and what we have right now is, is a dire need for, for um, more robust STEM competencies within the officer corps in particular. Um, I, we, we have some. Uh, I, I did a recent search and found that, that really if I wanted to send people to, PA, to a PhD program in, in all the acquisition officers, right now reasonable candidates, I have seven in the entire acquisition corps. Um, on the other hand, I, I found little buried nuggets. I'm, I'm at a, a, a vendor's looking at weld issues, um, and I find out that one of my PMs has a PhD in metallurgy and is able to explain why the weld issue is not really an issue. But we didn't use him. We didn't root him out. <laughs> Um, we have directed energy questions. I have a, I found a PhD in directed energy in my office. I didn't know about. So um, suddenly, suddenly trying to, one of my focus areas is trying to find that talent so that we can insert things. But it's going to be a limited number of places that you can really insert serious quality AI until we move to some new systems. Yeah, I would add three quick things to that, and I definitely agree. Uh, there are applications that you can do now on legacy systems, and this is, for example, what Project Maven has been working on. Um, computer vision is working shockingly well, um, and if you have a good video stream, uh, you, can, you can start kind of getting into that space pretty quickly. Um, there are also companies that are specifically working on low compute, low power chipsets. Uh, for doing some of this work that could eventually at some point be integrated into legacy systems. And the second thing is that hardware that's currently being used is oftentimes optimized for a human operator, and that might be exactly inverse correlated with the thing that's most valuable for the computer. Um, so one example of this is that we have this, uh, I'm just going to use a, an arbitrary example, but let's say you have like a camera that can see 10 miles. And that's, that's great because it's an exquisite system. It's built very tightly controlled. There's a human operator, so you want to minimize the range uh, kind of challenges that you would have. But a, a camera that can see 10 miles is roughly two and a half orders of magnitude more expensive than one that can see two miles. And it turns out that really, if, if software is your primary cost rather than human labor, you actually want to make the systems as cheap and ubiquitous as possible. So having like, hundreds or thousands of really low cost sensors that are running the same software in the background is a way more cost effective approach. Another example is um, like uh, medium wavelength infrared. These cameras can cost like 500,000 to a million dollars for really high quality ones. But it turns out that computers, um, I've gone through a program working on this at, the, at Andrew, the company that I started, the cheapest camera was actually the one that the operators disliked the most, but it was the one the computers worked best with. And so there's a very different evaluation in, in the system, the hardware system side, when you're employing computers. Um, and so yeah, I think like reaching ubiqu ubiquity at really low cost because software is your driver rather than human labor. Um, hardware is optimized differently for AI than it is for humans. And focus on the applications that are achievable now on legacy systems rather than trying to build really big kind of Skynet type approaches to the future. Afternoon, gentlemen. Afternoon. It'll come on. It'll, it'll, it'll come on. All right. Afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I know, sir, that you spoke about uh, um, spiral development to help increase the speed that we can get capability out to soldiers. Um, with that spiral development also comes spiral <coughs> testing, which I know testing is always an issue as far as uh, resources, both manpower, time, and money. Um, along with that, sir, you talked about we do not know moving forward if we will keep kind of our existing command structures and what uh, combat units and formations will look like in the future. Uh, my question is one, what are, are we doing currently or what will uh, 
Futures Command do to help reduce that time needed uh, for testing or to reduce the amount of testing uh, that we do? And two, has AFC or the Army looked into uh, identifying units to possibly be permanent testing or experimentation units that could test out these new uh, ideas, capabilities, possibly in an operational area? The, um, so as, as you, I'm sure you know, we had uh, a, a BCT down at Fort Bliss. It was the, the, the test brigade. <clears throat> and the Army made a decision about two, two or three years ago uh, that we could not, based upon op tempo uh, going through the Army, we could not afford to set a, a brigade aside as a test unit. So we no longer have a dedicated test unit. What, what we are doing now is kind of exporting that capability um, last year it was to Germany for the uh, AWE exercise and I think that's kind of the future is is we will export the evaluators to the unit as opposed to bringing a unit to Fort Bliss or having a dedicated test unit that's step one step two is we are uh, doing some experimentation right now with an organization called the multi-domain task force which is uh, organized around a fires brigade uh, I think it's the 17th out of JBLM right now where we've given it some additional capability to make it multi-domain capable. And there's a lot of experimentation going on in the Pacific right now through user pack exercises. And the common thread there is take advantage of existing exercises to test out not only new kit, but new concepts and new tactics and new ways of doing business. The um, you know, in terms of the shortening the timeline on testing, one is uh, have testers involved from the beginning. So when we write a requirement, when we get around to writing a requirements document, and I said that deliberately, so sometimes we rush to write a requirements document if we really understand what we want or what's possible. So when we get around to writing a requirements document, have testers involved from the beginning so we write that document in a way that can be tested in a relatively quick manner for a relatively small amount of dollars compared to what sometimes we write ourselves into. An example, mobile protected firepower. Uh, I was part of the requirements document. That is the G8. The fuel efficiency requirement that was in there had three decimal points. So when you test fuel efficiency to three decimal points, it would take ATEC a year to test that and millions and millions of dollars to get that. And the question is, why do I need to have it to three decimal points? So what's the difference between two and three miles per gallon? We're going to buy it either way. So just round it off. And so, I mean, it's little things like that. Putting a critical eye in the way we write requirements will do amazing things for, test, for you know, the shrinking the test timelines. I think this is a, oh, we, we got another question. Thank you, sir. Okay. You're our last question, and we'll give Jim or Murray the last word. He's our yes, first sir. Commander. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. My name is Greg Stevens, and I'm from Fort Sam Houston, Texas, where a lot of folks are looking 70 miles north and at USA Jobs. So, uh, <laughs> uh, sir, uh, you know, it's interesting watching this whole process of recapitalization from outside the Beltway. And uh, as you look at all the things that are going on to generate the funding uh, that is going to be reapplied to the six primary systems or the 21 systems, depending on how you're, which ones you're counting, um, you know, we hear that all the time. Almost 100% of the, of the message is about the build of that. We hear very, very little, if any, about sustainment. And uh, the interesting part about, about lethality is that it's short-lived without uh, valid sustainment. And uh, so my question is, how do, you, how do you build the sustainment into this process that you're looking at without losing sight of it as we go through it? Uh, just, just seems to me that that's got to be part of the whole innovative process, or else we're going to come out on the short end of the stick in the in the long run. Over. Do you mean uh, sustainment of the particular system or the overall? No, system? sir. The system, the the entire sustainment system, not just those systems, because those I'm assuming that those are going to be built into the to the process of building those systems. Right, examined yeah. up front. So, um, you know, as. Uh, as a mechanized infantryman, I, I have an appreciation, a deep appreciation for what you're talking about in terms of what it takes to sustain a combat formation. So in, in many cases, what we're doing to get after what exactly you talked about is, is asking ourselves, um, do we need as many as we think, as we say we need? So we'll develop BOIPs uh, sometimes and end up with astronomical numbers because scale does matter in the United States Army. So 
Does everybody, do we need as many as we say we need? Is there a way of cutting back on the numbers that we actually acquire? Um, a great example is, do we, do we need as many trailers as we have? I mean, you drive around the Army and there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of trailers sitting in everybody's motor pool because our doctrine basically says we have two per truck because, you know, you take one trailer forward and you bring one trailer back. So we're really looking at that. I mean, is there more economical ways of doing that? Um, do we, does everybody need, can we drive the old car a little longer, right? Is my eight track tape player good enough or do I need to go buy a cassette player? So it's little things like that that the, that the secretary talked about. Um, I, I did have an eight track in my first car. Um, <laughs> It's little things like that that the Secretary was talking about this morning is, is pennies will add up to dollars really fast if you look in enough places and, and ask yourself some fundamental questions like that. So that, that is, it's not discounting the role of, of the sustainment organizations and the sustainment architecture in this case. It's trying to find better ways of doing it and really asking ourselves some hard questions to, in order to free up those priorities because, frankly, if, if you don't have priorities, then everything becomes a priority and nothing in that case is a priority. I would also add that having sustainment expertise on cross-functional teams. So often sustainment becomes an afterthought when you're in the midst of a development program. I've seen this in private sector, I saw it in OSD, that having them involved in the front end. Uh, General Perna's leadership here has been really outstanding. He's been very supportive of General Murray and the cross-functional teams. So they're involved on the front end and they're weighing in accordingly. All right, thank okay. you. you want to Okay, um, so on behalf of the panel, I guess, um, we just appreciate, number one, you coming today, and number, number two, the obvious interest in, in, in the future of Army Futures Command. Um, and, and I just reinforce a couple things. Uh, you know, one of, one of my favorite stories is, and it seems to work well with most audiences, is the way I kind of envision this and the way that I, that I think this is, that, that, makes me wake up every morning knowing that what we're trying to do, and, and it is a we, right? So the secretary talked today about it's a football team, it's not a relay race. I think you'll hear the DEPSEC uh, def say tomorrow is we need everybody involved if we're gonna be successful. This is not the Army, this is not DOD, this is everybody to help drive this to success or we won't be successful. But I have a three-year-old granddaughter at Fort Hood, Texas, and 25 years from now when she's a Ranger, Airborne, Infantry, CIB wearing company commander. Um, I want her to be successful. And I want her soldiers to be successful. And that's really what this is all about. And that's what drives me every morning uh, to deliver for our soldiers. Uh, in some cases, somebody said this, they haven't even been born yet. So that's what I, I need you to get behind and, and help us all be successful. Thank you. <laughs>